Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Greenwood and Mulner Show here on Newcastle Fans TV. And what a guest we have got. We've got the main man of Sky Sports News right now. The man that's broken so many big headlines involving Newcastle United, not involving Newcastle United. It is, of course, the one, the only, Mr. Pete Graves. Pete, welcome back to the Greenwood and Mulner Show. How are you doing? Good. Thanks very much. What a lovely welcome. Lovely to be back. Good to see you both. And uh, yeah, follow what you guys are up to. And um, yeah, my, my son also watches a lot of your content and was uh, quite excited, actually, that I was coming on. So yeah, buzzing. He'll probably be watching this. He doesn't bother watching me on the telly anymore, but he'll probably see this. So Will, if you're watching, hello. We've got fans, Sam. We've got fans. Go on, Will. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Love that. No, he certainly is. To be fair, I've heard I've heard good uh, good rumours, or you can I'm sure you can uh, confirm these rumours before we talk about all things Newcastle United. That your son is a very very good footballer. He's all right. Yeah, he's not bad. He's not as good as his dad, but he can't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, um, where did you get it from? He's had a good season. He scored thirty odd goals this season. Um, but uh, yeah, he enjoy he really enjoys it. I've, I've coached the team under 12s in Gosforth, and uh, we've got a cracking set of lads, great parents, and it's all good fun. It's not too serious. We're not we're not telling all the lads that uh, you know that they have to you know watch their diets and exercise every morning, and and uh, and that they're going to play for England. We just we start by letting the lads enjoy it. That's the main thing, and then uh, see what happens from there. And they all do that, so that's great. So does does is Will the kind of victim of nepotism, or how, where where do you stand on the kind of parent coach divide? Is it is it more that you go easy on him, or you you make him work ten times harder than the others? We'll put it this way: uh, we had a game against uh, the team that were bottom of the league, and uh, I'd left little Gravesy on the bench, and we are one nil down after twenty minutes. So I brought him on. He scored a five minute hat trick. And I took him back off again. And the parents thought it was hilarious. And Will wasn't happy. <laughs> Booted a water bottle down the touchline and had a bit of a, a bit of a, a, I'm sure he's got some French blood in him. He had a bit of a strop, but uh, yeah. So no, he's, uh, it's, it, it, it's one of them. I'm not too hard on him. Somewhere, it's somewhere middle of the road. But, um, but yeah, there are moments like that where, you do think yeah, this could be quite funny because he, he, if you are the dad, uh, you know, it was, it was me and another guy that coached the team. Uh, both of our sons play and uh, we make sure that uh, we try and keep it as fair as possible with minutes. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, we've got great parents as well who support all of all of the decisions, I think. So you hear some of the horror stories from other teams of parents complaining because little Johnny got subbed off too early or, you know, wasn't allowed to take the free kick or whatever. We don't have any of those those problems on our team, thankfully. Yeah, I think me and Sam would struggle against the team. But then again, we did beat Loaded in the charity game. So if you do go back on a Loaded soon, Pete, just because we could we could potentially even sign you up if you want. If you want to if you want to join a winning team for next for next year's annual charity game, by all means, if, you, if there's a space for you there. I've got to be honest, lads, that they're already into me trying to sign Aren't me they? up for their team. So I don't oh, know what, I, what I'll are. have to do here. I'll have to maybe play half each or something. No, Literally, you, yeah. after after my half on your team, you'd be go saying, "Go on, go play for them now." Second half, you push me <laughs> on the other team. <laughs> I knew it. Typical Pete Davy. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> moving on. Um, what a season it's been for so many different reasons, Pete. Um, the seventh place finish would normally guarantee a European football. Not this season because Manchester United decide to win one important game this season, which is very, yeah. very frustrating. However, on a whole. What have you made of this season in a nutshell? Because there's been a bit, of, there's been loads of ups, a few downs, but isn't that just typical Newcastle United? Yeah, it was fun, wasn't it? I mean, I think in reflection, that's the best way to describe it. Frustrating and fun, I think, in equal measure. The injuries were a nightmare. The Champions League was an absolute ride. We deserved so much more. We played so well in those Champions League games, and um, just I can't believe we didn't qualify. But actually. Ironically, probably going out meant we were able to sort of put a decent second half of the season together and finish seventh, which, as you say, would have been enough for Europe. Would the Conference League have been right for us next season? On the one hand, I think we could have had a serious chance of winning it. And when I saw all the celebrations in Athens after um, after Olympiacos won, I thought, oh, that could have been, that would have been time side. And, you know, I would have loved to have been in it just from that point of view. But do we have the squad that could have coped with all of those games? I'm not so sure. 
So I've come, although I was disappointed at the time, I've come around to the thinking that actually next season, I'm very excited about it. We can focus primarily on the league, but also have a decent crack at the Carabao Cup and the uh, in the FA Cup as well. So hopefully next season um, we have a slightly higher league position because I know that the club's whole mindset is, I've said this before, is top six in a trophy. That's what the, that's the club mantra. That's what they go to every season trying to achieve. And I think uh, next season they'll, you know, they'll, they'll get close to doing that, I'm certain. Yeah, fun and frustrating, I think, sums it up perfectly because, like you say, on the one hand, two domestic cup quarterfinals isn't too shabby at all considering all the injuries we had. The Champions League exit, to be honest, I said this um, the other night on a, on a different show we were doing, um, the Champions League exit bugs me more than the Carabao Cup final. The way we were ahead against Milan and things were going so wonderfully and then it, I, I i will never forget luis enrique's face over in dortmund when he found out psg had gone through it was just sheer shock it's just so it was just so gutting and like you say about the the conference league we obviously discussed this on when you had me back on sky the other the other week um i i, I was all for away days to azerbaijan kazakhstan bring it on yeah, yeah. It would have been a- it would have been a tough sell, but it would have been a real, real big opportunity to get some silverware. But I don't, it, it's that annoying. is the negative. That is the negative side. You're right. We could have won that trophy, and I think we'd have been amongst the favourites. And um, that is that is the disappointment. I'm just trying to console myself by thinking we keep our best sort of 15, 16 players fit next season. Uh, it could be a very exciting season again. And I think you're looking at the competition. I think Chelsea had turned the corner. Now they've sacked the manager and started all over again. I'm not sure that'll pay off for them. I'm not convinced what's happening at Manchester United at the moment. I don't, I could be proved wrong as always, but I'm just not certain that the things I'm hearing and the things that are happening, you know, the, the rumours that they're going to put the whole squad up for sale it's like good luck selling all those guys you know what i mean it's like you know there's a lot of work needs to be done there newcastle have have ticked along really nicely they've bought well since the takeover they've got a fantastic manager and coaching staff and a great set of players i think the key thing for newcastle is to hold on to the squad that you and you know the players i'm talking about you know that you hold on to your brunos your isaacs and so on and then you add two or three quality additions and, uh, and I think it'll be a good season next season. But yeah, I agree. It is disappointing not to be in Europe, especially when we finish seventh. But but it could be it could be a good thing for us uh, in the long term. It's something similar happened in the past, didn't it? I think it was at 96 or so. And uh, we nearly won the league the following season. We missed out in Europe because of a... Something is something similarly annoying, and there uh, we ended up. We ended up nearly winning the league the following season. So uh, who knows? That could repeat itself. I think that was under Keegan. Yeah, the good old days. The good old days. <laughs> the good old days are back, though, aren't they? Yeah. The yeah. And and, and um, I I lived through the Keegan era. I lived through the Sir Bobby Robson era. This is my favourite time to be a Newcastle fan in my lifetime. I really, uh, I'm so excited about the future. That Paris Saint Germain win was for me such a seismic night in James's Park. And I know that we didn't go on and qualify in the end, but for me, it was the greatest night. People comparing it to Barcelona, it was bigger and better than that because it was the really the start. The Barcelona win came at the end of a great period where Keegan had been there and he'd gone, Kenny Dagley should come in. The, the club was just starting to just felt like we'd gone up to the top of the mountain, not quite made it. We we're on our way back down. The Paris Saint-Germain win, was that was like lift off? Here we go. We're back in the Champions League. We're beating one of the best teams in the world, who subsequently went on to the semi-finals. And Bappe couldn't deal with us. And then it was just and he and no, the story will will say that we didn't qualify. But for me, that was a seismic night for Newcastle United. It's a night that we'll be talking about in 20, 30, 40, 50 years time uh, as the start of this new Newcastle United, which is a very exciting thing. Certainly, certainly, I couldn't. I don't think anybody could have said it better, Pete. I think that night will just live in the memory of so many Newcastle fans, the, the hundreds of thousands and millions, if you like, because it, it was a case of where were you when Fabian Cher put that ball past on a rumor? Where were you when Miguel Almiron put Newcastle ahead early on? I've never heard noise at St James's Park like that when that first <laughs> goal went in. In particular, it was absolutely extraordinary. Um, it was the best atmosphere ever, wasn't it? And I yeah. just, I just, and I know, yeah. it's, I know it's, I know it's not easy. 
But I just think fans should all think about that as like every day. We have an incredible atmosphere, right? Incredible. But that night, it was on another level. I don't know how we do it, but as fans, and I, I'm in that stadium as well, so I take full responsibility. If we can recreate that every single game, we'll be I know everyone. it's not easy. We'll, we'll honestly, the amount of extra points we'll get in a season is a joke because when the when it's like that, we win. It's as simple as that. You go in, the noise levels, the, the opposition don't want to be there. If we could recreate that week in, week out, I still think we've got the best atmosphere in the in the in the country. I know it's like going, it's it's like going to you know Manchester City's players and going, you can do better than this, which Pep regularly does, by the way. And um, mm. but I feel like I'm saying that to our fans. We've got the best fans in the country, but if we can do that 11 out of 10 every single week. We will challenge for titles. We'll challenge for cups. No one will beat us at St James's Park. Yeah, it's, abs it's absolutely, absolutely incredible. I'm just going to say, it didn't that matter. Too. It didn't matter who we played that night because of that atmosphere. We'd have beat if it, even if it was Real Madrid, we'd have beaten anyone. It was <laughs> unbelievable. And I knew Agreed. I was like, like when you say Johnny, where were you when? Where you were you? I was in the leases, and I knew as soon as that header went in from Dan Byrne that that was a pure or fully fledged goal no dramas whatsoever 2-0 have that Donnarumma and I just, it's just oh god what a night what a night I mean like why would you want to be anywhere else it's just oh perfect it was a perfect night yeah it was great night one I'll remember forever and plenty more to come as well definitely you're talking about St James's Park there Pete it's just the start just comes to my head now Eddie Howe's been in charge, obviously, since November 2021. He's only lost seven home games at, at, in the Premier League at St. James's, And that is quite something, considering the fact that you've got probably, well, as I know, it was pretty much like two-thirds well, two of the season and then two full seasons. That's quite a remarkable stat. It, it is the, I think it is a massive advantage over teams, particularly around us that are fighting for, your, fighting for Champions League places. Um, and I think it's obviously the style of football and the fans together. That combination is absolutely electric. Newcastle obviously haven't, position-wise, positionally-wise, haven't done as well this season. Where do you think the drop-off was from fourth to seventh to this season? Where do you think it came from? Or was it just the fact there was just so many games? And, uh, no, I think it was injury. I do, I do think it was injuries. I mean, I think um, he, he, there was the Sandro Tonali situation. Um, and it was just like ridiculous injuries, so many. Every time you, you thought you got one back, you lost another two. Um, and I think it's, I think we were unlucky. You can look at all the sports science and everything else, but I think, um, I think we were just unlucky with injuries, mate. I really do. And I think, uh, that's lightning won't strike twice as far as that's concerned. I really think next season, um, I mean, I've got this thought theory on VAR as well, all the stop stoppages. And you, you, you know, anyone who plays sport knows what it's like when you get into a rhythm of playing and your, your muscles all warm up and stuff. And then you have these huge stoppages and everyone's standing around for a bit. And then I just wonder whether it had an impact on injuries because players were, Start the game, warn it, then there'd be a, a contentious offside decision. Everyone's standing around, muscles get cold, and then you've got to start again. I honestly, I, I've never known injuries like because it wasn't just us, it was a lot of teams in the in the league, in the Premier League, particularly had the worst injuries of their entire lives. And, and you look at what's different, and I like to look at what's different uh, before. And I think there were so many stoppages with VAR, and I think that's something they need to need to look at. It's never going to go away, VAR. And this, they're going to have a vote on it, it'll stay, but they need to make it. They need to make it instant, and probably with technology the way it's going, it will become instant, and it'll make it better for the people in the stadium and everything. But I think we're in a bit of a bad spot with that at the moment, and I think maybe that's had an effect. But could be wrong. I'm not a sports scientist or a doctor, but I just, I just wonder whether it had, had an effect. Interesting point, really, because I, I, like, I completely agree. VAR is here to stay, and to be honest, I've always been a fan of the technology. It's just the human aspect of it that's just severely letting it down for me. Um, but but like you say, Wolves can put it forward as much as they like. It, it 
it's it's not going to happen, is it? It's gonna it's gonna be persevered with. Um, Anthony Gordon said it right. He said he said he like it's just, it's got to be better. It's got to be better. Yeah. He said that after the after the uh, non penalty at uh, Old Trafford, where we saw the tear in the back of his sock and the blood coming out of his ankle, and he saw basically got wiped out by two people. And I think the difference was there that one of the players. It might mean Casemiro took the ball and the other one, I think, was Amrabat, was nowhere near it. And I think the referee just saw the ball go, but it was a bad decision. You, you look at the monitor for that, but why do they go to the monitor sometimes and they don't for others? And I, you must have seen a thread today. I, I, I sat through a thread while I was uh, this afternoon on disallowed Newcastle goals over the years. Now, I've been at quite a lot of them. Um, and there was the, the Rob Lee one from inside his own half. <laughs> <laughs> which I still wind Rob up about to this day. And uh, they gave a free kick to Newcastle on the edge of their own penalty area. Uh, a couple of the goals from Czech Tiote, the one against City. I oh. mean, a couple of them didn't understand, but yeah, it was just like nothing stopping that strike from Czech in the top corner, but they found a way to disallow that one as well. But what I will say is, and I always say this, as Newcastle fans, you, you we always think that people are picking on us, but... There's probably every club in the Premier League could do a similar list of this loud goals, and and it happens to it. Unfortunately, it does happen to everyone. Um, and I always say this: there are no conspiracies going around. It's not like the referees are all getting together and going, "Let's disallow it because it's Newcastle because they've got Saudi money." You know, it's it, it's just it's just the way football is. You get you win some, you lose some. You get some good decisions, you get some shocking ones, and over the course of a hundred years, it evens itself out. <laughs> No, no, the the referee must have put Anthony Gordon's sock down to shoddy castor quality. That that was that's the only explanation. But Adidas is coming soon, and we're all excited about that. Have you seen the new shirt yet? Are you are you in the know? Have you been behind the scenes? Have you been part of the advertising campaign? What do you know about the uh, the shirt which comes out this the end of this week? No comment. I can't talk about it. <laughs> oh. I but it's uh, look, all I all I all I'll say is that um, Adidas get get the club and they get the fans and uh, it's going to be really exciting. I think I've never known such excitement for a kit manufacturer. It's it's <laughs> crazy. Only at Newcastle. <laughs> yeah, it's um, but I think it's it's the romantic the romance of it all that. Um, that they, uh, you know, they the history between Adidas and the club. I will, I will go out on a limb here and say, by the way, that I, um, the, the guys, I know the guys at Castor and the great, great guys, and I think it's been a bit, a bit unfortunate in in some ways. It's a bit like uh, I think yes, they were there before the takeover, and um, you know, when when it, when a club gets taken over, it's a bit like the old manager. You got to, you want everything to You almost want to clean the decks and start again. And uh, the timing was perfect for Adidas to come in, but um, but yeah, it was um, it was uh, it's going to be exciting anyway when 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 the new kit comes out, and I'll uh, I'll be in the queue at the the club shop ready to buy it. Yeah, well, it's just been announced today that Newcastle United Foundation are getting five pounds from every shirt that gets bought online and on the website as well until the end of August, which is absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. Absolutely. Well, a great example. I mean, the Newcastle United Foundation, by the way. And Newcastle United's football club were basically completely different entities. They're, they've been brought together, and it's fantastic to see. It's like you look at the difference now the women's team, the foundation, the, the men's team, the academy's getting sorted out. The, you know, the training grounds have money spent on it already, but will be more. There's talks about the stadium. Everything is being aligned now when you compare to what it was like under previous ownership, where it was weird because I used to do stuff for the foundation and the foundation wouldn't know what was happening to the club. And then the club, and it was almost like, it was weird, it was like two different entities all together, but all of that's gone and they, they work closely together now. And I think that thing for the, with the kits is sensational because the foundation do amazing work in Newcastle and in the Northeast um, and beyond with, you know, the help, the help and support that they offer to people, and the, the lives that they change with the work that they do is amazing. So, uh, I'm all for any support that they get from the club. It's brilliant to see that Adidas and uh, and Newcastle United have have, have come together and, and put that together. It's a it's a it's a brilliant uh, a brilliant thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just you just mentioned about the the ground. I, I, I would love to get your opinion on this because the increasing the capacity of St James's Park has been mentioned for. 
a long, long time, even before the takeover. There's obviously rumours about it's, you know, probably 10, 15, 20 years ago about kind of get bigger and bigger. What's your personal opinion on it, Pete? Do you think that Newcastle United should look to extend at St. James's Park where they are? I'm passionately, I passionately think it should stay at St. James's Park. And if they can find a way of increasing the capacity at St. James's Park, I know they've got the best people looking into that. I would obviously a lot of other people are reporting on that as well. Or do you think that Newcastle should move to a different part of the area to build their own state-of-the-art stadium? Because if they can get more people in through the doors and they can you know, try and maximise even more revenue if they can, you know, buying, obviously getting the stadium together is obviously a massive job. But as soon as it's built, it could be, you know, when you see, look at the Tottenham ground, for example, it could be absolutely spectacular. Where do you, where do you, uh, what's your opinion rather on this? I'm really torn because I, I've been going to games since I was a, a, a little kid and I, I used to stand in the Milburn paddock next to the dugouts there. And um, when I first started going, I mean, a lot of space in there sometimes, you know, and I'd be like, I, you'd be kicking the football around with one of the other kids or something and on a, on a, on a Tuesday night. And, I, and I, I had such happy memories going to watch. Newcastle is a, is a little lad under Jim Smith initially, and then I was your dealers. And I still to this day sit up there in this in the Milburn stand and I look down and I think about where I used to sit sometimes on the side of the pitch on the cinder track, like picking up the pebbles. And I, I feel very emotional about the stadium and um, the memories I've got in there with my with my friends and my family. Uh, I've sat in just about I've had seasons where I've sat in just about every stand growing up from from sort of seven, eight years old when I started going. Um, so I've got a lot of emotion about it and it would be great. I mean, in an ideal world, you just want to make that one massive arena and complete it all the way around and it would be sensational. That would be the perfect scenario. If they can't do that, though, you, you know, don't you, that, that you could sell out a 100, 120-seater stadium and I just think... <sighs> Yeah, it's one of those where I say this a lot. I'm kind of like, if the club decided we're going to move, I'm not going to be one of them with a banner going, you can't leave St. James's Park. I think we've got to hand a little bit of trust over to the club to make these decisions. It's like, I remember all the, all the sort of Ferrari when Mike Ashley was going to rename the stadium Sports Direct Arena and everything like that. And I was, I was furious at the time. My mindset's changed slightly under this ownership because I'm like, they're moving the club in a totally different direction. I think back then we knew, we thought, oh, they'll change the stadium name, but it's not going to make any difference. But now I'm thinking, if the stadium, if they got a massive sponsorship for the stadium and they were able to reinvest that money, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't complain about that either. You know, naming rights and stuff like that. And if they decided they needed to move to make a big, bigger stadium, I'd be like, I'm kind of a bit at the moment, whatever you guys decide. I know for a fact there's great people making decisions in the football club and I, I'm, I'm kind of back it. So perfect scenario, make St. James's Park bigger. If they tell me that actually, you know what, it's going to be better if we move to another location in Newcastle and we can build this massive stadium. I think once the fans saw the plans and everything else, I think people would probably get on board. So that's my thoughts. Perfect build St. James's bigger, but if they have to move, then let them move. My, my, my gut feeling is that St. James's Park will probably would be increased before they move, but that, that's just a gut feeling. I don't have any intel on that. It's quite a tricky one though, isn't it? Because okay, let's say St. James's is going to get expanded, but you know, like it's the only fan base where all of a sudden we're, we're plane watchers, experts, and now we're all ar expert architects. So if you've got to move the pitch a bit, and then the stadium has to be developed that way, like that's obviously going to take time. What are we going to do for home games? We, we, we can, <laughs> can ground share with Gateshead for a season, or that, that that doesn't really seem feasible. So it's, I suppose maybe a new stadium all of a sudden becomes almost sort of easier. Yeah, because you say St James's Park till it's ready. Yeah, it's a good point. It's funny what you say. Though. You're absolutely right. We're playing spotters. We're doc. As soon as there's injuries, we're all doctors, aren't we? And uh, physios. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's like we're now we're all architects. When we talk about this, it's so it, it's mad. We all we all <laughs> as fans <laughs> and have passionate arguments with my mates on WhatsApp groups and. One of the lads will say, what are you talking about? Neither of you know what you're talking about. And you think, yeah, fair play. We don't actually. What are we doing? Why are we arguing over someone's medial ligament or something like that? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, 
<laughs> like someone someone suggested that it's because of the pictures here and it's like we don't have a clue what we're we even talking about um but yeah i mean you're right they could if they did build a new stadium they could stay at st james's park and you could have it give it a proper farewell and sort of have one last game a bit like they did at upton park with west ham and i remember that they beat manchester united in their last game in that stadium and again it was a bit like what we said with psg the atmosphere in the stadium that night they would probably would have beaten anyone um but I'm mindful of the fan. West Ham's a good example. They've got this big arena now in London, and uh, you know oh, you speak to a lot of the fans. The, the, a lot of the fans you speak to them. I, I know a lot of West Ham fans who still talk about Upton Park. A lot of Arsenal fans who still talk about Highbury. Um, the one Tottenham seem the Tottenham fans seem pretty happy in their new stadium, but uh, see how long before they start talking about uh, White Hart Lane. But um, that seems to be the one where they've they've seemed to have done a great job building the, the new place there. Certainly, certainly. Um, Anton Gordon, you mentioned him before. So unfortunate not to get not to play for England on, on Monday. Obviously, got that injury um, against well against Manchester United, didn't he? Where he couldn't obviously play against Brentford on the final day. Um, did you agree that he was the player of the season? I know there was a few contenders: Bruno, Isaac, even some people mentioned Fabian Scher as an outsider. Um, did you agree with the, the club deciding that Anthony Gordon was the player of the season? I do agree, actually. I do, yeah, yeah, genuinely. Um, I think that the the improvement from last last year, where a lot of people were sort of giving him a lot of grief for sort of um, think, thinking, you know, who, who Eddie had made a mistake in that signing, and you saw in the documentary, the Amazon documentary, how much that Eddie believed he was the right person for the club, and it's just been proved right. He's been brilliant. I hope he gets in that England squad because. Um, he really deserves it, uh, and uh, I, I think I think he will. I think he will. I think in the games he played, he didn't have no harm. I expect he'll probably play some role on Friday, playing Iceland at, uh, at Wembley Stadium, and I'm hoping to see him involved in that. And if he gets an opportunity, he'll take it. He's been not only our best player; I think he's been one of the best players in the whole Premier League this season. But I put Isaac in that category and Bruno as well. Those three have been. Absolutely sensational this campaign. So yeah, but Gordon edges it just because I think we saw such a massive improvement where Bruno and Isaac were great last season as well. I mean, Isaac, Isaac really impressed me this year. I mean, his finishing is is absolutely so, brilliant. So good. He's so good. He's so good. Um, and we just got to get more players like that. What's amazing is now, and there's no disrespect to the the, the players that've been there a while, but. If you're going to write a list of our sort of like five, six best players, they've all been signed since the takeover. I mean, the recruitment's been really good. Um, I think we've bought extremely well. We haven't got many wrong. Um, and usually most clubs sign 10, you know, five good ones and five duds. We're working at sort of 85, 90% quality signings from the ones that we're making at the moment. So the recruitment and Steve Nixon, um, done a brilliant job with Eddie Howe's input. Uh, I don't know if I was panicking about directing the football and like Dan Ash with that. They, no, I, for me, there's no big hurry there. I just think just wait. I think things are all right. Things are working well. We've got a great scout there and Steve Nixon and uh, we've got Eddie Howe's got a great eye for a player as well. I think other people at the club involved, I think uh, I think things are all right. There's no, no stress there for me. We don't have to hurry anyone in and wait for the right person to come to become available. A couple of things to, uh, to pick out from what you just said there, Pete. Um, and I remember last Saturday when I was on Sky with you and I mentioned that, you know, City need to leave Bruno alone because we're in June. It's a big, big month. This is the only month that Bruno's release clause is active. Um, so it's terrifying because for me now, I think the argument of who was better, Bruno or Rob Lee or whoever... For me, Bruno has safely eclipsed Rob Lee now, and and for me, the best midfielder I've I've seen in black and white by by a mile. Um, you said something to me, which kind of gave me strange reassurance. You said, "Don't worry, Bruno and Isaac are going nowhere." <laughs> Elaborate, I've, please. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident. Look, I'm, I'm gonna end up with egg on my face if I'm wrong, but because I, I've said this to everybody, but I'm very confident that when the season starts next season, um, those two will both, both be 100% Newcastle United players. I think as much as anything else, I mean, I think, 
I said this a few weeks ago. Um, I think you've seen Isaac's comments probably today, just reaffirming how happy he is at the club. Bruno and Joe Linton are like brothers. Uh, their families are settled, not just their, their partners, but the, you know their, their, their kids are here and their parents. And I just think they're so happy at the club. And uh, I think they, they they signed to be part of the project, and and uh, that project is still ticking along. So I've got no worries about that. I think I think that I don't think Newcastle are in a period where they'll they'll sell players that they don't want to sell. And even if someone were to trigger the one hundred million release clause, he then have to go and actually who's going to trigger it city you know there's so much going on in manchester city they're not going to go whack 100 million on a, on a player right now i just can't see it um people talked about paris saint germain isn't sure it 100 they're... mil for bruno i think it's cheap I, I think it was i think it was an amount that suited both parties um you know it is you know you could say it's cheap but New, it, with FFP, Newcastle could do a lot with 100 million as well. Um, so I think it was one of them where it's it, it it's a, it's a, it's an amount which club might tempt some clubs, but of course it would only really tempt a club after July the first, and no one's going to do it before July the first because no one can. I really don't think they can. So it would have to be after that, um, and it's expired after that anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah, I just I just can't see it. And as for Isaac, people saying, "Oh, linking Isaac with clubs," we paid nearly seventy million for him, and he's improved massively. You know, he's one hundred and fifty million quid, and that is Easy. in the in, uh, yeah, in the, in the current climate, Neymar's chucking one hundred and fifty million quid around. So, um, yeah, I just I'm very confident both will, both will Steve still be there, and it's it's various. Many different factors that have gone into my thoughts with that. Yeah, definitely. We'll stay on the theme of players that are still at the club. Miguel Moron and Callum Wilson get a mention a lot from fans. Well, everybody, let's be honest, that has an association with Newcastle in some variety. Um, would you say they're the two players, if Newcastle were to sell players that maybe can have a bit of value to the football club? Would be potentially potentially be the players that you will see leave Newcastle United, or the other players that maybe we haven't even thought of. Oh, it's really difficult, isn't it? Um, I kind of always had this thing in my mind that like Trippier and Wilson would 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 stay at the club and then sort of go to the coaching staff. Uh, they've worked with Eddie Howe so long, um, and Wilson, when he's fit, he scores goals. Man, he's had a bad season with injuries. I don't know. I don't know whether I know people are looking at him as an easy option to make a few quid, but what's the fee? What what are people going to spend on Wilson considering the injuries he's had? Um, so I don't know. If 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 we were, I think we should sign a striker regardless. I think we should sign a young striker, um, and uh, and it would be nice to have have Wilson as well because I think as an impact sort of when he's fit to to come off the bench, he'll always he'll always nick a goal. I thought Trippier, by the way, he's someone else to be mentioned. I, seeing him play for England the other night, I thought he was absolutely sensational for England. He was a leader for them and almost almost played with a freedom that I haven't seen him play for this season in Newcastle. You could tell Southgate, you know, rates him massively and he was just he was just he was in the ear of uh Ebre Eze and tell, tell him what to do. And he was he was captain on the night and he, he led from the front. He was really impressive and you forget what a good footballer he is. Um, so if, I never want to sell anyone. Like Miggy, Miggy's my mum's favourite player. She just loves <laughs> Miggy. Like every time she's like, me, I don't know whether it's his, he's always smiling and he's just playing. No, I, I, I'd be disappointed to lose anyone. I mean, I think you, you, the players that you'd want in an ideal world, you'd want to leave are the ones that are a little bit further away from the first team. And you'd like to have players like, Wilson and, and, and Miguel Almiron. I mean, imagine that how how valuable they're going to be. If you if you want to go on and be like Manchester City, you've got to have two two good strong 11s. Players like Wilson and Miguel Almiron in the in the sort of in the in the cups and in players you can turn to with with twenty minutes to to spare when you've got someone in come on with that sort of pace of Almiron or with the the finishing nas of Wilson. So. Yeah, it's always difficult. I'd like us not to have to sell anyone, but I, I think we we're, we're going to have to, and uh, just sort of leave that one to uh, leave that one to Eddie. But I love them all. I don't want any of them to go. Um, I think we've we've seen. Well, obviously, we've seen 
the likes of Richie and and Dummett and Carius and that be be released. Um, you know, is Debravka someone you could get a few quid for? Maybe that would be someone you could if they're going to sign a new keeper. Um, I don't know whether he's happy at the club. He obviously had that spell away at the club at Manchester United. And, uh, he knows he's going to be second fiddle to Nick Pope as things stand. So is he someone you could sell? Um, don't know. Don't know, lads, is the answer. I'm not a big fan of this selling the uh, the homegrown lads either. I know that from a, a, f a financial fair play point of view, if you sell Longstaff and Miley and Elliot Anderson and these guys, it's pure profit because they've come through your academy. But not a big fan of that. I, th I like to have a few local boys running in the squad as well. So, um so yeah, don't want to sell anyone really. There's no one in this squad that I'd, I'd say, you know, try and get him out the door or anything because they've got a great group. Uh, they've got a great group there. I don't know. People accuse Eddie of being too loyal sometimes, but that's kind of what he's all about. That's why the players love him. That's why he, that loyalty is so important in football, um, and it's working for us. So you know, I think that loyalty. I can see why he is the way he is. And I think it's, it, if you look throughout the history, when I wrote my book, when he was at Bournemouth, he was exactly the same. He stuck with the same team, took them up from League Two, basically the Premier League, and there's still lads in there. He basically did what we've seen the likes of Luton Town and Ipswich do, but better. They had no, they had literally no money. They couldn't even afford to fix the holes in the roof of the stadium and couldn't pay wages and so on. And what he did at Bournemouth was unbelievable. Um, and what he's done at Newcastle is sensational. Eddie Howe for me. I hope he's the manager for the next twenty years. Honestly, yeah, absolutely. Hope he does it because there was there was not real strong rumblings, was there? But when things were kind of not going our way and the odd frustration starts creeping in, there was a few murmurings that is Eddie under pressure. It, you know, could could they be looking in to a replacement? You know, the Saudis aren't here to muck about. But there was never any serious danger of him losing his job. Was there and 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 like you say, the the job he's done so far is is it's just been fantastic. And I mentioning Dummett and, and Richie there in particular. I mean, Dummett, what a servant! And, and Matt Ritchie for me, one of if not the most important Newcastle player from the past decade, from from getting us out of the Championship and securing Premier League safety year on year before the takeover. But um, how much have we really got to spend this summer? Because we were hampered in January, obviously. So we we know we don't want to lose Bruno, and no one can really afford Isaac. So how much is there to sell so we don't Ooh. get in breach of PSR and FFFP? I think we I think we could just do a selling one. I don't know who that one is, but I think we we could probably do a selling one to to. Um, to make sure that we're not in a, putting ourselves in a sticky on a sticky wicket. So one one out before July the first is what I understand, and um, and after July the first, it's a clean slate. So you basically got three years worth of money you could you could spend in there. Uh, yeah, sir, get the checkbook. One window, but um, obviously they won't do that. But uh, I, it's a clean slate in July the first. New accounting period, so um, my understanding is that, that they'll 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 have a bit to play with, and it's when the Champions League money and the seller money and the Adidas money and everything else kicks in as well, and certain sales that they did make, Alice and Maximan and stuff, it all kicks in after July the first, doesn't it? So uh, my understanding is there could be a few quid to spend. I wouldn't expect massive massive money, but I think you know maybe in the ballpark of a of a hundred million would that be a, a, a fair prediction? what they could probably do after July the 1st, I think would be around that ballpark. But again, uh, here I am pretending to be a financial expert. And when I look at that PSR, the, the way it works, my mind absolutely clouds over. So uh, I could be, I could be wrong. Darren Eels will tell you, you need to get him on the show. Oh, we'll, 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 we'll be trying. We'll definitely be trying <laughs> for that hundred um, percent. But yeah, to be fair, just to mention Darren Eels, I think he's done a fantastic job since he's walked through the door at Newcastle. I think the, 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 the amount of times you see him, just talk so passionately about Newcastle United. I think it's been really, 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 really good to see. He gets the fans, doesn't he? I he mean, does, the, he? the famous Macam in Milan thing when the Champions League draw was made and it's drinking pints at the Carabao Cup. And he, it, but he does it in a way where he, he's he got a lot of class and he's someone I, I like a lot. And I think um, he's got an incredible track record as well in his, his own career. And I think Newcastle are benefiting massively from, from him being there. Um, and, and I think as well, just on Dan Ashworth, everyone was disappointed that he's gone, but uh, he was at the club for 
long enough to sort of put his a lot of the Ashworth isms in place. So he kind of he kind of he kind of served this not said he served his purpose, but he kind of you know he put his things in place and now he's gone. But we're still basically running the club in the same way. So um you know so from that I point think of view, it's I think brilliantly it's- hilarious how they've handled that because they're just not giving in to Manchester United at all. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> I think they'll probably have to come to some kind of a agreement at some point, um, you know, and, and uh, it was disappointing that Dan left. And I think that um, I, I don't know whether geographically it's a, it, it's easier for him. It's closer to, to home and everything else. And obviously there's this, it's a, I mean, Manchester United is a massive football club. It's where Newcastle want to be. Uh, it takes a long time to get to that sort of, that sort of level and when you're talking about levels you're talking about worldwide sponsorship deals their worldwide support of fan bases i mean i've i've done a lot of stuff with ex manchester united players and they, they go all around the world and like people like you know are fainting it's like the beat you know you, you know players like david may going into like the forest <laughs> asia play people are fainting <laughs> and uh what, what what we hope is that um in in years to come That'll be Newcastle and and uh, and 40, 44 year old Bruno Gimorens and uh, and Alexander Isak are walking around like Australia and New York and uh, people are going wild in Newcastle United shirts. That's where the club want to be, but it takes a long time. That, that it's you know it's more than uh, it's more than than people's lifetime to sort of grow into that club, and that's where Newcastle want to go. But it'll take time. I can't imagine anyone fating at the sight of David Rosenhal in like. 10 20 years <laughs> you never know you never know you never yeah. know <laughs> definitely definitely <laughs> um moving on um <laughs> incomings <laughs> that's probably what you probably get asked on a daily basis pete i can imagine doesn't matter if you're in newcastle london there'll be a newcastle fan somewhere asking you who we're bringing in who we're bringing in who we're bringing in no it happens every day, you know. It happens, yeah, honestly, imagine. mate. It happens every day. Even when I'm in London, someone will stop me and go, who are Newcastle signing? I'm like, <laughs> me. I'm going to laugh. But it's, yeah, every, I, it, I do find there's Geordies everywhere, isn't there? And, uh, but, yeah, no, I mean, I think um, I think there's, obviously, the, the talk's developed quite quite far with Tossin, Odder Abayo, who's now signing for Chelsea instead. Uh, Lloyd Kelly, the talks have developed as far as they did with Tossin. Um, so I'm hoping that Lloyd Kelly is the first one through the door. But as I said last week, uh, with, I was with Darmesh um, and uh, we said on Transfer Talk podcast, another podcast, we said um, in, until it's done, it's not done. And people would be... People, yeah, it's so frustrating, really. You get these I, in the know accounts saying, "Done deal, it's done." They've already posed for the photographs with the shirt, and and fans believe it. I mean, they just like, and so then we put out put out a tweet going, you know, talks are progressing, and they go, "Hang on, you're a bit behind the times. Do you not know, lads? It's already done." As though we're like, as though we get our information off Twitter, you know, and it's like. Hang on, it's not because we've been speaking to the people doing the deal five minutes ago. But the, the sad thing is people do believe everything they read on social media these days, which can make our job quite difficult. And what happened was with Tossin is that the talks went well. I think things were more or less agreed. But because he's a free transfer, he wanted to see what else was out there. And he's been he's got a better offer financially. And it means he doesn't have to move out. It's, it's up the road from where he was anyway. So that he's gone for that. Um, Lloyd Kelly, slightly different situation. I don't think there's many others in for him at the moment. But um, my, my, my last I heard was he'd gone on holiday. But I think the talks have gone well there. But it doesn't mean that someone isn't going to come in and just, you know, blow us out the water. And I know Newcastle fans are like, oh, well, why don't we pay more? We should pay more. But we're talking about a couple of free transfers here from a couple of mid-table Premier League teams. You can't just say, oh, well, we'll chuck 180 million at them. And all of a sudden you're paying them more than players like Isaac and, and Bru- you know, it shifts the whole dynamic of the squad. So I think I think they have to stick stick firmly to the 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 pay structures that they've got in place. They've got them in place for a reason. And it should be certain players earning the top dollar. And you don't just... There's players in the squad now earning a lot of money that aren't playing in the team. 
because they didn't get the uh, there's a couple that they got wrong from that point of view and that is so frustrating so <clears throat> so yeah so i think that newcastle have a value they have a wage value they'll offer that money but they'll not they'll not go miles over the top you know if so with lloyd kelly if if a chelsea who seemed to buy everyone decide to offer him 200 grand a week then he might he might go there but i'm hopeful that uh that he'll be the first first signing of the new window for newcastle <laughs> Can I ask you, Peter, about the goalkeeping situation? Because I know you mentioned Dubravka before. Um, the Athletic have mentioned James Trafford, who's worth obviously doing. Uh, he's in the England team, uh, England squad rather, and he's, been, he's obviously highly rated across amongst a lot of people within the game. There's been links with Aaron Ramsdale, another England goalkeeper as well, who's obviously second choice at Arsenal, but again, an outstanding goalkeeper. There's also been mentions of the Valencia goalkeeper, whose name I'm not. I'm going to try Mama Ridge. Mama's got a dish, Philly. Well, maybe I don't know about I don't know about how the best pronunciation, but the two questions. It's Mama Dash Vili, isn't it? Mama Dash Vili, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah. I'll, 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 I'll let you. I'll let you because you've got. A, you might have to say it on Sky, so I'm hoping that you'll be the one that can say the best out of the three of us, anyway. <laughs> but the two questions I want to ask about the goalkeeping situation is: A, do you think a goalkeeper is a priority this summer? And B, do any of those names excite you and think actually, you know, that that's the sort of goalkeeper that Newcastle that need to take them to the next level? I'd go for Trafford if it was me. It's not me, but I'd go. That's who I'd go for um, if they could get him, like for fifteen, twenty million. I think Trafford would be a would be a good addition. I think he could play understudy for Pope, but playing all the cup games. And um, if Pope picks up another injury, you've got someone there who can come in and, and, and is ready to play Premier League football. Um, Marmadashvili is a top, top goalkeeper. He would go in, I think, probably ahead of Pope. Um, if you signed him, you might sell Pope. Like, I don't think Pope's going to sit and be a number two. Um, it's a very de de delicate balance, isn't it? You look at the two top teams, Arsenal and Manchester City, they've they've got two number ones. But look how unhappy Ramsdale is at Arsenal. If you're going to sign him, is he going to come in to compete with Pope at Newcastle? I just can't see that really. That he will want to wherever he, wherever he goes, he's going to want to be number one. Um. So if you sign, if you for me, if you sign Ramsdale and Marmadashvili, you're getting rid of Pope. And if you sign Trafford. Trafford can come in and exist within the goalkeeping structure. Makes sense to keep Gillespie local, local lad, and loves the club. Gets on well with all the all the team, and it is part of the fabric of the of the squad. So it makes sense to keep him. And I'd probably sign an older keeper. We were joking before, weren't we, about um, David De Gea? But my, you know, maybe maybe an older. I think you've got to have four goalkeepers. So I'd say, I'd sign a top young keeper who who would be my number two. And I'd sign someone who could maybe, you know, someone in it, someone who was late thirties, early forties, who could come in and just be the fourth fourth keeper. Yeah, Fred Gillespie's already doing that kind of Scott Carson role, isn't he? And I love him yeah. for it. Um, I mean, the pictures that he's been putting on Instagram lately of his stag dude look fantastic. Um, <laughs> but I know, but, yeah, it does look good, doesn't it? it does look it good? It does. But. He's having a great time. But with the goalkeeping situation, I suppose some cynics could say that, well, Trafford lost his place to Murić at Burnley, who's a championship keeper at best. I suppose you, you want to see your squad progress and, and, like you say, have two good number ones. Um, is, I, I suppose think it works is, having think... two number ones, though. I mean, City was a great example. They got a fantastic... But now, look, he's come in and done some... Had some good games, including the FA Cup final, and now they're saying Edison's off to Saudi. So I mean, it's like I, I, it doesn't exist to have two top top goalkeepers. I don't think. I think you need to have your number one, and you need to have someone either younger or older who can deputise. Um, I, look, I hate to say it because I hate having to go up players, but we we miss Pope so much when he was out. I mean, the, the Martin Dubravka. I've just. Uh, I just, he's a top, he's a good shot stopper, but I just felt so nervous when he was playing. I mean, it, it was more I felt for the defenders because you saw so many times they weren't comfortable going back. So they'd end up clearing it and we're back on the back foot over and over again. Whereas as soon as Pope came back in for the last game of the season, it was like, it was so relaxed at the back. You know, I know Brentford ended up getting a couple of goals back out of nothing really, but it was dominated and then just the, the defense looked so so relaxed um 
So I think it's really important. I think Pope, I think you give Pope the number one spot next season. And I think you, you sign someone who can challenge. And I think Trafford be would be a, I mean, he's you're not in the you're not in the England squad unless you're quality. And he's in the he's in the 33. Pope's not. You know, I think Trafford, if he if he was willing to come in and you could give him the cup games and you could say, you know, you're going to be our future number one, then I think that would be that he'd be the one I'd go for. If I went for one of the others, Marmadashvili or Ramsdale, I'd be thinking, well, that's because I can sell Pope, and I, I don't, I don't see that happening. Yeah, it'd be very interesting to see what happens with the goalkeeping situation. It has to be said. Um, I suppose because I've said this to Sam for the last two years, and and, I'm, and like I say, I know this is just a hypothetical question, but I'm going to ask you this because Sam for the last two years has said. I would love to see Sandro Tonali in a Newcastle shirt, and I'd love to see Alexander Isak in a Newcastle shirt. And each summer it's happened. He doesn't always get the inside noise or anything like that. But is it is there a player for you, Pete? Realistically, if you could just have a magic wand and go right, that's the, that's who I'd like to see in, in, in the summer. Because I know, for example, last year for me it was Mr. Diaby. I just thought that he would be ideal for Newcastle on that right hand side. That was just that's just my personal opinion. But if you had a magic wand for this summer, who would you say you'd like to have in a Newcastle shirt? Did you call Tonali and Isaac, Sam, did you? Yes, I did. And in, um, fun fact, if you go on Sky Sports News' YouTube um, page, I was on Good Morning Transfers talking about um, Isaac, saying he could be our, our Aguero. Not comparing him to Aguero, because different players, but he could be our Aguero. And uh, a friend of mine the other week sent me some of the comments on that video calling me a lot of silly, silly names. And I just look back at the season Isaac's had and I smile. And I Welcome think, to yeah. my world, mate. And they never apologise yeah. afterwards, do you? They never <laughs> apologise. When I, when I first reported about Saudi Arabian interest in Newcastle United in the takeover, I got... Um, so much abuse from the Newcastle fans who thought that I was get, I got on the payroll. I was making it up to sell season tickets for my best mate, Mike Ashley, who I never actually met, by the way. Um, but uh, but yeah, so it was. Uh, it just goes to show you can you can call things and, and you're wrong uh, and they think you're wrong until you proved right. And then very few then come and uh, come back out and say, it'd be lovely, wouldn't it? If people get, hey, by the way, I call you every name under the sun. I'm really sorry. I've realised now I was wrong. You're right all along, but it doesn't. It doesn't always happen. Um, for me, players that I'd like to see come in. Um, it's a really hard one, isn't it? You know, I, I think. I, I think. Uh, I think we probably need a right winger. Um, <laughs> I was sitting. I, I went to the Champions League final last week, and uh, Jaden Sancho is a good player. He's a good player. Yeah. Um, if. Uh, if Eric Ten Hag stays at Manchester United, he ain't going back there. I think he'd quite like to come to England. Um, I'm no, I'm no intel on that at all, but I was watching him thinking he's really good. How's he not in the England squad? Um, and I, I do, I, I like the Eddie Howe model of, but I do like the fact he signs England internationals. But I've always been like that. I mean, I um, went my, well, he, I played a lot of football manager as a kid, and what I used to do was I set out and I would try and buy the whole England team. And this was my ultimate goal. Then I'd apply for the England job and my I pick my England 26 and the entire 26 would be the Newcastle 26 that I just assembled. Brilliant. If that makes sense. And that was, what I, that was my... Love it. I set out every single time to do that. So I'd buy all the best English players and then I'd become England manager and just pick 26 Newcastle players, including goalkeeper, subkeeper, the whole squad. Um, that's what I did a year in, year out on well, it used to be called championship manager when I was growing up and now it's football yeah. manager. So um, so I do like that, and that's probably why another reason why I went for Trafford from the keepers as well. I just think he's gonna be the future England keeper. I think we've got the future England right back in Tino Livermento. I think we've got the future yeah. England left back in Lewis Hall. Um, I like it's great to have a sprinkling of quality foreign players, your Botmans and your Isaacs and your Brunos, but I do I do like I mean. I do like having England internationals. I love it when the, it's exciting when the Euro squad comes out, the World Cup squad, and you look down the list and it's like Newcastle, Newcastle. You know, I love that. And I like to see it in the under-21s and the under-18s. So uh, that's because I'm an England fan as well. I, I, I support England and I support Newcastle. And when there's crossover, I really I really enjoy it. So, um, so yeah, Sancho would be on there for me. Uh, Eberé Eze the other night. 
Um, Ooh, we're talking yes, Ezra, by the way, not Eze. If you ever want, it's Ezra, oh. not Eze. We we'll email went around a day just there as a little nugget for you. So, um, Ebra, Ezra looked brilliant at St. James's Park. He's so positive. You say about Isaac, he reminded me the first few games I watched of Isaac, where I was like, oh my God, this guy's the most positive player. He got it, he didn't play it backwards ever. He was like, he got the ball, he's whipping it in, he's constantly on the front foot. That's what uh, Ezra reminded me of the other night. I thought, really positive gets his head down so he'd be someone if he could sign in be absolutely sensational the other the, Wharton at Palace there's oh, about five yeah. at Palace I would take honestly yeah at least say you would take from Palace as well um yeah so yeah there's a they would be dream signings for me um yeah, probably, probably in England. And actually, Wharton was really impressive the other night. Branthwaite, yeah. the centre back as well. He's going to be a top, top player. He'll go somewhere. He's probably going to Everton are going to try and get a lot of money for him. But to play him alongside Botman at the back, in a you know, that those two could be your main centre backs for the next like ten years, couldn't they? So yeah, he'd be yeah. he'd be good as well. It's quite interesting, though, how the pair of you both went for a right winger. And, and my bid for three out of three in three consecutive summers is also a right winger. But mine's um, Takakubo from Sociedad, the okay. Japanese international right winger. But I, I've not seen us linked with him whatsoever. But then again, when I said Tanali and Isaac, we were never linked with them either. But hopefully... He is incredible. You, you must watch an awful lot of football. Do you ever get out of that room that you're in right now? Yes, well, I, I, well, due to the nature of my job, football is 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 on a lot as well. So, in when when working late in the evenings, then there's Bundesliga on, there's La Liga on, there's Liga on. on. So, why why wouldn't you just have a quick scout? You but know, you would so. do very well because I know, you, like me, you're a family man. I've seen your WhatsApp picture. You are a family man. You've got kids, and it's sometimes not easy, is it? Because uh, I uh, I know. My- I know I try. I would watch football from the minute I got up to the minute I went to bed if I could, but I just can't get away with it anymore. So I come to work to watch football. That's basically the best thing about working here is it's wall to wall. Everything's on in every league. Um, exactly. That's one of the best parts of it. So uh, I happily come into work every time. But once I get in, it's not like I walk into the house and all the kids are waiting for me. I'll just wait there. <laughs> going to watch Real Sociedad because uh, <laughs> that he's right winger who uh, Sam said is going to sign for Newcastle. He is. He's 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 he's, he's fantastic. And and you know anyone watching or listening, go go and um, have a look at previous Sociedad games. I'm sure there's montages of you on um, montages of him on YouTube as well. I did also say. Um, last year as well about Florian Verts, but he, he ain't a secret anymore and there's no chance we're getting him for less than 100 million now. Um, but that's that's one of them. But would you say right wing is sort of the priority? And, and you mentioned a centre-back before as well. You'd like to think the next kind of centre-back we buy other than Lloyd Kelly would be the one to partner Botman for the next five, ten seasons because Cher can't go on forever, bless him. Yeah, yeah. L- L- the beauty of Lloyd Kelly is he can play left back and he can play left sided centre back as well. Um, I think we need a right sided centre back, don't we? Just but Fabian Cher has been brilliant, like you say. Um, but I think he needs an elite level right sided centre back. And Eddie Howe is a defender himself, and he'll 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 want someone in that role long term. Again, someone young. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Branthwaite would be the one. I, I thought, again, anyone who was at the England game the other night, he came on and his presence instantly, and he would be the pick of them. Uh, you know, we talk about Palace, Mark Gahey, but for me, Branthwaite is the is the one, uh, if you could get him. But he, he he's going to cost a lot of money, but Everton do need to sell before July, you know, before July the 1st. I don't know whether Newcastle are going to have any money, but um, they need to sell not just before July the 1st, probably after as well. So would, he, would they sell him for... I mean, 50 million, I, don't, I think that would be a great, great deal if you could get him at that. Um, yeah, I know there's been reports of 60, 70, but if you could get him for 50 million with sort of certain clauses and add-ons, I think he'd be a top, top player going forward. But it would eat up a lot of the budget, of course. But I think, I think I'd rather see us sign two mint players than four or five, like not so. So if you if he could sign Brandtwaite and an essay or a lise or something and just have two then it would be a good window for me yeah totally agree uh just finally pete um we'll talk about the podcast with Darmesh in a second but just a light-hearted question what's the best ever away game you've ever been to because 
it, obviously we've seen it so many different away crowds report in Newcastle when it's been good, when it's been bad, when it's been all sorts. Yeah. It's, it's a one game that stands out. I know it's particularly in this season, you've definitely been to a few away games with your son, which obviously you mentioned at the, at the beginning. Yeah, I'm quite lucky. My dad took me to away games from like when I was when I was little, and I, I think of some of the things I saw uh, on away days with my, with my dad when I was a kid, and um, I, th- I mean, I, I, my son now doesn't see, and I'm talking about we used to get on the buses, and um, I remember being at one of the first away games I ever went to was at Roker Park, and it was absolute pandemonium, and we were moved like the, it, it was so so overcrowded in the Newcastle end that they moved the section of us, walked us down the track, and stuck us in like in a little area with other Sunderland fans, and it was just I just remember looking around and. It was all hell was breaking loose, uh, and um, and I, so that was a memorable one. I remember because Liam O'Brien scored in that one as well, but it wasn't the free kick famous one where we beat them. It was a, it was an equaliser. It was a brilliant, like lobbed. He lobbed the keeper. I think the keeper was Tony Norman, and he lobbed him from about thirty yards, and uh, we were all celebrating, going mad, and we were in the Sunderland section, which was a ridiculous situation. Um, that was a, a memorable one for me. Uh, best away games. There's been some good ones recently. I was at the I was at Southampton when Bruno did the back heel volley. Um, I was at that season actually. There's some good ones. Leeds away when Shelby curled in the free That's kick. That was a really good day, and it, and it actually proved to be such an important win. I remember being so nervous watching the clock tick away at Ellen Road, and that win propelled us on to a great end to the season. Um, <sighs> It was great to go to Dortmund. We didn't get the result, but I, went to, I was in Dortmund last so season. We. It was just the fans were brilliant, weren't they? Oh. And so welcoming. And I really wanted them. I was at the Champions League final on Saturday and a part of me really wanted Dortmund to win just for the supporters because they were so, so welcoming to the Geordies. And I actually sat at that game. I was in there. Uh, I was, I was lucky because... I get invited to a, to a lot of games from, you know, I'm very lucky from that point of view because of what I, what I do. And I was invited to that game. So I was in a neutral stand where there was loads of Geordies. And so was I. Being that How did I not see you in had, there? Had the yellow wall to the right of me. And then yeah, Newcastle that's the one I was in. And I have to say, um, it was, it was mint, wasn't it? It was like, there was a oh. little caravan selling beer and I was just mixing with the Dortmund fans and they were, you know they were brilliant. Not and it, a spot it, it, of bother. Not a spot of bother. It was fantastic. Um, so that was a memorable away away day as well. I, and because because I used to do the commentaries as well. So I went to some really mad places when Newcastle were in Europe back in the day. Like Zolte Varigem uh, was a, was a good one. And like so I've been to some honestly some some crazy away days. And there'll be people watching this who've been to like millions, but. Uh, Oh, I don't know. Uh, to pick to pick one, the pick one would be too hard. Um, yeah, probably one that I've been to with with my with my son. I would have said in the last couple of seasons because um, he's loving it and he's on the journey. My dad took me. I was very lucky. So we started going in the Jim Smith era, like I said. Went went through the sort of Aussie Art dealers here and then when Keegan took over, it was just incredible. And I and, and I I was about the same age then as my son is now. And just loved every second of it, and he's having that same journey now. Um, and I just love just watching him. Really, it, it's actually, and any dads watching this will know you kind of get your love back. You, especially working in the job I do, you can kind of fall out of love with football. And you, when you see all the stuff and you work with the players, and you know some of them are fantastic, but some of them aren't, and some of the clubs can be frustrating and annoying. And it's easy to fall out of love with football, but when you have your own own kids going through it and enjoying it you totally you go back to being a fan again and um you know i'm i'm just i'm loving every second of being a newcastle fan right now absolutely absolutely buzzing with everything that's going on and, and watching my son enjoy it um is is very very special so i know i've, I've given you a really long answer to a simple question there but no. uh can't pick one i can't in, in answer to your question to pick i can't pick one away day out which stands out really yeah, to be fair, some of the away games you mentioned there, like I, I was at Leeds and that was that seemed like a big moment at the time. You, you're quite right. It was a big, big moment. Big goal from John Joe Shelby after that happy old man here run, most memorable thing uh, at Newcastle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what a run. Yeah, absolutely right. 
He was, I like always liked Mankio. I thought he came off the bench. He always did a good job. Like always liked him. Sam's not did sure. He? I did he, did, he, did he really though? Oh, I granted know. that Leeds game, he he probably won us that game. He was superb that day. Yeah. Yeah, I, that, I thought he always did pretty well. But I don't. Can't, he's not one of them. Where I ever thought he had a real stinker. I thought he was done done okay. You know, not many players signed for Newcastle who previously played for Sunderland and, and sort of get away with much. But I thought he was. I thought he did all right. He was one of the. He was one of the the better signings from a from really rubbish periods. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, with the way things have gone with former Spanish Newcastle players, Manquillo could well win the Champions League next season. Anyway, <laughs> after Hockley, <laughs> my word, who saw that oh, no. coming? Well, they reckon Pe- oh, yeah, they Perez is going to go to Barcelona, I read somewhere, and you're going to oh, have God. El Clasico next season with the two strikers going head to head. You know, it used to be Ronaldo and Messi. Now it's Perez and uh, uh, Hosselu. So, uh, yeah. Ash Mad Traff Hulk. Lazar currently in talks with Bayern Munich. <laughs> uh, <laughs> unbelievable. Get the band back together. That's what we should do. Get the band back together. <laughs> well, well, Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. I'm sure we could talk for hours and hours and hours just about all things Newcastle now, and a little bit of England as well. But um, again, the, the, the Transfer Talk podcast with you and Dharma is just absolutely superb. You know, you get to the nitty gritty of all the transfers. And, and, and I know it's only the beginning of June, but it feels like you're always busy. You've always got stories to look into. So again, highly recommend watching. It is probably the most popular podcast for this time of the year anyway, for the next two or three months. So yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're very, very busy. Like I say, hopefully, I was going to say stress free two or three months, but is, it, is that ever the case with the transfer window? No, not really. Not really. Um, but I've got a bit of holidays booked in, but it, it, my wife goes crazy because my phone's constantly ringing, like to uh, check certain stories and. Um, you know, but between Darmesh and myself and Keith Downey, and, and we've got little WhatsApp groups, which, uh, which, and you, you, Sam, you're saying about your your own eye for play as well. It, it, there's a there's a WhatsApp group where I called last summer's business very very early actually, so I had a good window last yeah. summer with regards to knowing the knowing the players and uh, and and bringing them to the fore fairly early. So um, so yeah, it's it's down there in. Uh, in black and white, and I do remind Keith of that quite a lot. But uh, he's usually pretty, pretty quick as well. But uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a good, I had a good summer last summer with my intel. So we'll see what happens this summer. But certainly for the time being, I think, like I said, Lloyd Kelly hopefully first, and then we'll see what follows after July. But I'm um, hoping it's going to be a good window. I'm sure it will be. I'm sure it will be. You have to tell us those predictions off there. Anyway, but it's still anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see how we get on. But yeah, it's been really, really good. Thank you so much, uh, people, uh, again, for everything that you do in terms of get, helping the Newcastle United fans out as well. We really do appreciate it. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Good luck with it all. See you soon. No problem. From myself, Jonathan Green, my co host, Sam Mulder. We'll see you all very soon.